Okay, um, after that short delay, we'll get started. Shoaib, talking about tuning PostgreSQL. Yeah, uh, so before I start, I just wanted to get some idea about how many of you guys are using Postgres in production. Oh, that's great, that's great. Because <laughs> I, I don't get to see that kind of uh, feedback anywhere else. So yeah, that's great. And how many of you tried tuning the Postgres server and found it really hard to do? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's ex I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm a Postgres consultant, and I work for Fujitsu, so we do the same thing as well. We help customers with tuning Postgres servers and giving support services as well. We do 24-7 support and businesses support as well. So, yeah, uh, the, yeah, it's over there as well. So, uh, We'll be looking at uh, uh, looking at uh, like basically going through a few things that we can cover in the next 20 minutes because uh, tuning the database server is is a very uh, uh, it's a very big topic. So we will just be covering a few things because we can't basically go through everything in the 20 minute time. So we're looking at procedures uh, that we can use uh, for diagnosing performance problems. Uh, uh, for the Postgres server, and then how do you benchmark your database server for performance, and then um, a little bit about database monitoring as well. So let's starting with uh, the procedures that you usually carry out to uh, diagnose performance problems. First of all, you need to identify the areas. So uh, I basically cut it down to starting with doing the application analysis, looking at the SQL, looking at the memory usage, uh, that involves the buffer cache that Postgres is using, and then looking at the storage setup that you got, file system, and the very famous PostgreSQL.com file that people found really hard to tune. So uh, starting with application analysis, uh, the first thing that you look at is how the application is interacting with the database, whether it's using, uh, it's basically reading large amounts of data, if it's writing large amounts of data, uh, are you using any ETL jobs, using any analytical queries? So because they, they basically are all, all really matter because when, you, when you're tuning your PostgreSQL.com file, uh, you really need to think about all these kind of things before you set up those values. So yeah, you have to be really careful with uh, with the kind of way the application is working. And I, that's that's something that I've always found uh, that the sysadmins had a really hard time tuning these things because they don't really at times know how the application is interacting with the database server, and they've given this job to tune the database server. So it's it's a it's it's a very hard job for somebody who doesn't know how the application is interacting with the database server, and you're trying to tune the database. Uh, the next thing is SQL, uh, like finding what are the problematic queries that are taking a long time, because that's the first thing. That's a that's a starting point basically to find out those queries that are taking the long. Uh, that are, that are executing for longer months of time. So a best way to do that is install a query analysis tool on top of your database server. And what those tools do is that they basically uh, look at the database server log files, and uh, they can generate some very nice reports uh, on the basis of data that they can gather from the server log files. And uh, a couple of them, I've put them in the presentation as well. Uh, so, some, uh, EPQA is the one that I really like because it's uh, it uses Perl, so you don't have to install anything else. But if you're using PG Fuin, you have to install PHP as well because it only works with PHP. So I usually prefer using EPQA. That's that's much nicer and it gives you a very nice report. And once you found those SQL uh, queries that are that are problematic, uh, the next step is using Xpend Analyze on those queries. Has anybody over here used Xpend Analyze? and found it really hard to understand the output. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the next thing. So uh, there are some uh, nice tools that can help you uh, understand the expert analyze output. So uh, I, can, uh, I can explain those tools after the presentation if you really want some more detail on that, because we can't really cover everything about the explain analyze output in these 20 minutes. So yeah, but the next thing is you will look at the plan and see where exactly in the plan are the parts which are taking the most time, and then start debugging those areas. Um, another thing to note about Explain Analyze is that never uh, try to use Explain Analyze with the DML 
type of queries because uh, if you're doing a simple explain, that's just giving the estimates. But if you're doing an explain analyze, that's basically executing the query as well. And then it's giving you the actual times. So if you're doing a DML type query, that's an insert, update, or delete, it will in fact run that query as well. And so the changes are all done on the database as well. So just be a little bit careful debugging the DML queries. Uh, the next thing to look at is uh, memory usage. Uh, first thing you need to, to gather is uh, the size of database. If it is small enough to fit in the memory, or if it's not, if, if you can't really fit it in the memory, if it's like, say it's a, it's a 800 gig database or a one terabyte database, and you can't get that much of uh, RAM on that box, then you need to look at getting faster disk uh, to basically nullify that effect. And uh, other than that, you, sh you should be looking at the buffer cache usage. Uh, Postgres uses both the OS cache and its own buffer cache as well. It's a little bit different than other databases. Uh, something that I've noticed with Oracle DBAs is that they would think that Giving, uh, giving all the shared memory to uh, the database will get better performance. But with Postgres, it won't give you the same kind of behavior. So you need, because Postgres will be using the OS cache and the buffer cache together. So at times you will see double buffering as well, but a Postgres manages it very intelligently. So you, you basically have to look at how a Postgres is using the buffer cache. In order to do that, uh, Postgres comes with uh, PG underscore buffer cache contrib module. Has anybody used contrib modules over here with Postgres? No? So uh, contrib modules are the contribution modules that come with Postgres, and uh, there are uh, RPM and Debian packages available for those contribution modules. So as soon as you install them, they're all installed uh, within the Postgres SQL installation, and you just need to run a few SQL scripts to get them all uh, going. So PG underscore buffer cache is also one of them, and uh, that helps you look at the buffer cache, like what exactly is in the cache right now, and how are the tables using the cache that is available for Postgres. So, and like you can see, uh, you, you can basically relate to uh, the most used tables and see if they are being cached properly or not. If they're not properly cached, there's something going wrong over there. So that's how you basically look at the memory usage for the Postgres database server. So if something is wrong, you need to look at increasing the shared buffers for a Postgres server or looking at uh, how you're using the OS cache. Um, next thing about memory is uh, looking at the query plans and uh, looking for uh, anywhere in the query plan where it's using external disk because uh, Postgres uses uh, uh, Postgres uses the RAM for doing sorts uh, during the query execution. So if you see a sort using an external external uh, disk for doing the sort, that's that's a terrible thing for the query. So keep a watch on the query plans and uh, look for lines in the query plans where it says external disk sort being used, because if it is using that, then that, that's a bad sign. So, and that usually happens when you don't have enough memory available, and Postgres has no way to go about it instead of like, it just goes and uses the disk, and that's like using the swap. Uh, next thing is looking at the storage. Uh, so what type of storage setup you're using. So uh, you can use a direct attached storage or SAN. I would, I would always recommend direct attached storage because I've seen some, I've had some terrible experiences with using a SAN because uh, uh, we, we had a customer who was using uh, a NetApp SAN. That's, that's very good if you tune it properly, but they had one big aggregate that was using 48 disk and they didn't give the database a dedicated, dedicated aggregate and everything else like the exchange server, the database server, file server, everything else was using that same uh, aggregate. And the database was always competing for resources. It wasn't getting all the resources that were required. So we ended up going towards a cheap direct storage setup. So instead of giving it uh, the share from the sand, we just went with a direct storage. And that usually gives you better performance because you know that the database server is dedicatedly using that chunk of storage. Uh, the RAID setup, I usually recommend RAID 1.0 because uh, uh, doing some benchmarks with RAID 1.0 and RAID 5, we found out that if you are using a write heavy database, uh, RAID 1.0 will give you better performance because with RAID 5, you are storing that extra parity information. So that becomes a hit on the right performance. So yeah, we usually recommend uh, going with RAID 1.0. 
Uh, other than that, look at the IOSTAT outputs from time to time. Uh, I would have customers uh, set up scripts in Nagios and then do trend analysis on those IOSTAT outputs to see any spikes that they can see uh, while the database server is doing the normal activity. And if you do see them, uh, you need to look at the bottlenecks. Where are, the, where are those bottlenecks? And also look at the queue sizes as well. If you see the queue sizes uh, going abnormally uh, when you relate them to the number of disks available, then there is something wrong uh, and there is some bottleneck with the I.O. somewhere. So you need to identify those areas as well. Uh, and then the rate control settings. Um, usually these days rate controllers come with uh, right back cache enabled, so, but you, you need to verify if your rate controller is using the right back cache. And uh, they usually come with battery back cache these days, so just make sure that your rate controller is battery backed as well. And something that I've seen people uh, usually ignore is that they don't monitor their battery health. They, they think that they've got a battery back, battery back uh, rate controller, but they don't monitor the battery health. So when you have a crash, your battery is not in a, in a good health, so it won't be able to do a proper crash recovery even if you had a battery back uh, rate controller available. Uh, and then Postgres uh, has got table spaces. So that can be very useful if you're trying to distribute data across uh, different storage locations. So a good starting point is separate your indexes and your table data onto different table spaces. That basically helps you uh, with the IO loads. And then uh, transaction log files. This should be on a separate storage area as well, other than your data folder. Uh, that helps with the IO performance, especially with a write heavy database file system. Uh, everybody has its own uh, uh, preferred file system, but uh, I usually go with XFS, and uh, that's what like we gathered after doing some benchmarks against ext 3 uh, And the reason for that was that XFS had a better journaling system, because it only journals the metadata. It doesn't uh, journal everything else. So yeah, XF we found XFS to be much better than ext 3 on doing benchmarks against Postgres. And XFS is much better with bigger files as well. And uh, each Postgres data file can be up to one gig in size. So yeah, we just like, um, I know everybody has its own preferences about file system. And I know XFS doesn't have a lot of tools available that ext 3 would have, but yeah, it's, it's, it's your own decision. You just need to do benchmarks as well, but I found XFS to be better than ext 3 uh, Something to note with XFS is that uh, it comes with barrier support enabled, so it would be a good option to use no barrier uh, when mounting the file system if you're using a battery back write controller, because if you're using a battery back controller, then there's no use of using a no barrier support in XFS. And then comes the famous PostgreSQL log con file. Uh, there are a lot of parameters that you can tune in that file, but we can't really cover every one of those parameters in the time allocated. So I'll be just covering a few of them, which are very important. Uh, first one is shared buffer. This is the value for the database uh, buffer cache. So Postgres basically uses that cache to do read writes, and it stores uh, important information in this amount of cache. And uh, uh, this is this uh, this this basically is a chunk of memory that is taken from the shared memory, and is allocated uh, as soon as you start the database server. So Postgres starts using it as soon as uh, the database server starts. Uh, a good starting point for setting up this value is uh, use. 25% of your available RAM. Uh, don't give it like the 70 to 80% of your RAM, uh, just like the way you do in Oracle or other database servers, because uh, Postgres doesn't like a big shared buffer. You can get into uh, buffer lock contention problems if you have a really big buffer cache. So again, use PG underscore buffer cache contribution module to monitor your shared buffers and see if you really need for the tuning for the shared buffers, or you need to uh, cut down the value of shared buffer. Uh, next thing is effective cache size. Uh, that is not the value that is, uh, that is not the amount, it basically is taken again from the RAM, but it is not the memory that is allocated to the database server right on the database server start. It's just a value that's used by the query planner when it is picking up an optimized, uh, optimal plan for the query execution, so basically, it is, uh, the database server sees uh, this value as the total amount of OS cache available to the database server. So it will look at this value 
and we'll get a proper uh, plan according to this value. So if you have a bigger number for this value, uh, it will be able to pick up an aggressive uh, query plan using, an, using a proper index. And a uh, starting point for that is start with 75% of the available RAM. And uh, you basically take this number out of uh, getting output from free or top and looking at the numbers for free and cached and yeah, uh, free and cached. So yeah, it, you just start with 75% and then uh, monitor the query performance as well. Next thing uh, that is very important is the work mem. Uh, this is the amount of memory that is used by sorting operations during the query execution. So um, basically you, you, you try to avoid as much disk sort as possible. And uh, a good point to start is look at the explain analyze output. And with Postgres 8.3 and above, it shows you whenever uh, the, whenever the query is using the this sort. So whenever you see something like external external merge sort or external sort in the in the query plan, you know that uh, I don't have enough work mem available, so I need to raise up the value. And the good thing about this setting is that it is session based, so you you can set it for a specific session, and that session can use that amount of work mem. You don't have to set this value and restart the server to uh, put this value in effect. So you can just use it on a session for a specific query. So like the queries where we are uh, doing, uh, we, we, we're basically working on large amounts of data. We usually uh, set up the work memory to a high value, like in multiple, multiple gigs of RAM. And then we run that query so that the query can use that amount of memory. Uh, next is maintenance work mem. That's the amount of memory that's used by the DDL operations, uh, like the create index uh, operation, uh, re-indexing the database, um, or changing uh, or altering the table to add a foreign key, or all the other DDL operations uh, use this maintenance work mem. Again, this is session based. So uh, when you're doing a bulk load job or an ETL job, and uh, at the end of it you want to create an index, you basically raise this value to a very high number and just create the index, and you'll be able to use a lot of memory. Uh, the next one is auto vacuum. Uh, that's a very important setting. So by default, it is enabled on Postgres 8.3 and above, and it should be let enabled because if you don't enable it, uh, that means that you can end up having database bloats, which is which is not a good thing. So uh, what it does is that it looks at the threshold values for each table, uh, and those thresholds are like uh, for analyze. They depend on the number of when you have a specific number of inserts on a table. Auto vacuuming uh, process will uh, go and try to do an analyze on that table, and the same thing goes for the vacuuming as well. As soon as you, as soon as vacuuming, auto vacuuming thread finds out that a certain number of updates or deletes have happened on the table, it will go and try to vacuum that table. Again, you can find those threshold values by analyzing your. Uh, there's a, there's a very a useful view in Postgres that's called PGSTAT user tables. So that gives you the number of inserts, updates, deletes for a specific table. So you can look at those numbers and find out the threshold values that how many inserts or updates or deletes you're getting every minute or every hour. Uh, and with 8.3, a very nice feature came in, uh, which is uh, we, we, we have worker threads available for auto vacuuming. So before that, auto vacuuming was a single process. So only one table could be vacuuming, uh, only one table could be vacuumed at one time. But now with uh, 8.3 and above, you can have parallel processes doing vacuuming and analyze on different tables. Uh, next is default statistic target. It's, uh, this basically value sets up uh, the amount of sampling you need to do on a specific table when analyze runs. So analyze is a process of collecting uh, statistics for a table, and those statistics are then used for uh, getting optimized query plans. So this value by default is 10 in 8.3, which is a bit low. Uh, it should be set to 100 at least. Uh, but again, it depends on the kind of queries that you're doing on in your database server and looking at the query plans. If you think that the query plan is not uh, what you really want it to be, then you need to raise up your stats because uh, the, the Postgres server is not able to get proper stats. Cool. Uh, next is checkpoint segments. Again, uh, you usually set it to a very high number if you're getting bottlenecks on the I.O., uh, especially when you're doing large amounts of write. We're running a bit short on time, so I will just cover the next slides quickly. Next is benchmarking. Uh, I usually use uh, Bonnie++. 
uh, for doing benchmarking on the database on Postgres database server. And uh, the recent version of Bonnie Plus Plus is really useful. I found it really useful. Uh, the one after uh, 1.96, I guess. Yeah, I guess they're going to release the next one very soon. So that is 2.0. It also gives you lag times as well. And it can do some tests that are really database oriented. So yeah, I've used that in the past, and it's it's it has really helped me in uh, finding the bottlenecks uh, with the Postgres performance. So keep on doing the benchmarks every now and then to find out uh, how the behavior is changing. And then for the database server specific activities, you can use PG Bench to find TPS uh, transaction per second and see how the database behavior is changing from time to time. Monitoring, uh, use the normal Unix commands like iostat, dstat, top, and keep on uh, putting them in a database, or and then uh, try to do trend analysis on that. And then the last thing is check Postgres.pl script. Uh, that's a Nagios-based plugin. It's a very useful plugin if you have a Postgres database server which is in production because it can automatically check for it can automatically check for the bloats, it can check for the checkpoints, it can check your free space memory, and it can alert uh, the admins about any kind of uh, problems uh, beforehand. So, yeah, and then uh, you should be using a combination of Nagios or, or tools like Ganglia so you can uh, get proper graphs on the trends uh, for your database server performance. That's about it. Any questions? Okay. Um, we don't really have time for questions because we're running a little bit late, but perhaps you can talk to him um, after the sessions. Yeah. If, if you have any, got any questions, just tell me about it. Thank you.